If you are vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be your big debut. This episode is for those who want to try DMing, and we want to dispel every fear you have around it so that you can join the ranks as one of the great storytellers of the world. In this episode, (laughs) we're going to (laughs) ask, what about the rules? There's so many rules. Yes, and how do I build a massive creative world for my players to play in? And... How can I role play and act out all of these wild and wacky and fun characters that I'm supposed to entertain and dance around like a puppet master for? (laughs) Well, you can do it and it ain't that hard. Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Jordan. And I'm his brother, Travis. So how do we get into DMing and taking the edge off of this immensely daunting task? And before we get into that, I want to say... The DMing is amazing. It's fucking amazing. It's the greatest high when you DM a stellar game. Yeah. And the reason we're coming to this whole thing, if you go anywhere online, go onto the D&D Reddit, you can see that there are just so many games that are not being played because they're lacking a DM. Tragic. And there is... So many players out there just looking for a DM. Absolutely. So why are there so few DMs? The feeling of of telling and leading that story that you're all creating in that moment is so rewarding in a way that I've never experienced in anything else. And from a player's perspective, it's like having a character that you've put all this time and energy and amazing thought into and extrapolate that times a hundred. Imagine making a world. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a collaborative, really cool experience. But then when you get into that kind of stuff, I can understand why it's a daunting task. Because going into being a dungeon master for the very first time, I remember being in that position and it's like, it's friggin' terrifying. No, yeah. no times a hundred yeah. because it just seems so challenging to get into there's so and like it conjures images of russell crowe in a beautiful mind just (laughs) seeing all of the things all of the rules and they're just popping up in front of you and it seems like a lot yeah when you're a player watching what a dungeon master does you're right it was so stressful and terrifying before i tried it and understood what it was i wanted to try it for so long beforehand but just being anxious and nervous leading up to it. it was so uncomfortable but i finally tried because of what we're talking about there's so many players that i knew but not enough dms so i bit the bullet and jumped in planning for that first session took i don't <laughs> even know how long because i wanted to overdo it and overanalyze it and all those things well and i would imagine that even that so you go into dming you're like okay i'm gonna do this and then you just get overwhelmed by all of the prep that you have to do. And it's, yeah. it is, it is daunting to say the least. But as soon as I actually started playing this game, because remember, it's a game with my friends. <laughs> it's supposed to be fun. <laughs> yeah. The realization hit me. We're all here to just have a good time. And that's what they're here to do. So all my over planning and stress kind of fell away. Like you're just hanging out. And I think if you do it right, there is a certain amount of collaboration that can be expected to happen with players when players are kind of brought to the table with some expectations that they're contributing to the world as well. Yeah. It doesn't have to be all on the DM to just be like, you be the grand architect of the entire world that I'm going to play in and I'm just going to sit here and gobble up your nom 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 yeah. nom. And it's like, get that entertainment. Feed me, monkey. It works much better to go on a journey. That's, that's the other way around. <laughs> you don't want to... I want monkeys to feed me. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> Only in D&D. And I think that another thing that's kind of standing in the way of a lot of people getting into being a dungeon master 
is this kind of outdated, outmoded way of DMing that it's like, oh, if you can't do it that way, then I have no place being a DM. I don't have that same kind of style of being, I don't know, the kind of scary, intimidating DM that has this elaborate story and they are the writer. And if you can't adhere to their style of story, Hmm. then you're not. And you don't have to DM that way because actually it's kind of a bad thing. (laughs) <laughs> in my opinion, we have to we have to change the way that DMing is being done because there's this idea that you have to be this like railroady DM making your players sit through this weird pseudo sex fantasy and a mishmash of every edition <laughs> of D and D. And if you weren't raised in the '70s of being a DM, then you have no place at the table. And it's like, no, there's this really cool new way of DMing that is collaborative and is fun and it doesn't necessarily have to adhere to all the rules and anyways I'm sure we'll get into a lot more of that yeah there's so many different ways like you said there is a new way sure but anyone can DM any goddamn way they please as long as everyone at the table is having fun and if anyone tries to tell you that you're doing something wrong at the table (laughs) but everyone's still having a good time then you're doing it right and that's the that's the coolest thing about this, and I think that's why this episode is going to be so impassioned, is that this is the greatest, most constructive, liberating game in the world, and it deserves more players, and in order to have more players, you need more DMs, and DMs with neat ideas that can treat the game however they want to run that game, as long as, like you said, everyone is having fun. Yeah. If I came up to a D&D table and I said, oh, you're playing D&D, cool, what are you doing? We're playing Monopoly right now in the middle of this D and D game. I'd be like, "Rad! <laughs> it's never, weird and never it's seen different." It. <laughs> but how does this work into your? Yeah. And I remember starting DMing and realizing that I had no idea what I was doing and where to start. And I had no kind of mentors. We weren't really playing in any games at the time because, again, you and I just kind of started DMing for each other. And I think that was a really good way to start because we weren't really judging each other too hard. Yeah. And there's something to be said about starting to DM with a group that has never seen or played in a game before because nobody has any idea what they're doing. So there's that aspect. But just the daunting nature of having no idea where to start, I wish that somebody had given me kind of a primer as to just like, how do I cut through all of this other static Yeah, and just get to the core of what I need to do today. I'll work on the rest of the skills later, (laughs) but just what do I need to do to just start? To just run a game. Then, of course, you mentioned those mentors, and I think it's important to remember that they're mentors because they're experts at this craft. When you see the streamers and the people that are leading these really popular games, they're really good at it. They've practiced for years, and that's why they're a mentor, but it's a new skill. You're not going to be great at it the first time. That's fine. No. No, but you do have to start somewhere. Yeah. So start here. Let's go to the strategy stateroom. Okay. This is the strategy stateroom, where inventive and cunning tactics are crafted for when they're needed most. All right, so in this strategy stateroom, what we want to talk about is how to dispel those early fears and some of the, maybe the misinformation that's out there. Yeah, because I am full of fear. (laughs) Not about DMing anymore, but... So, fear number one, the rules are so freaking many. Yes. Yes, there's literally books. There is so many books with so many rules. A textbook? And... You have to, as a DM, obviously, know them all before you start. Memorize the book, recite it to yourself before bed, Sleep every with it, <laughs> look at it, stare at it, spill breakfast on it, live with it, marry it, mm-hmm. raise some children with it, <laughs> and then you will know the rules. Then this you can is start. How you, <laughs> this is how you be a DM. No, the, you don't have to know all the rules to become a DM. And I get why people think you need to know all the rules, because in other games, you do. In games like Monopoly, 
you need to know all of the rules because the rules exist to determine the winner of the game. The rules of chess exist to determine the winner of a game of chess. And so without yeah. those rules, you cannot determine, without really concrete, absolute, line-in-the-sand kind of rules, you can't determine a winner. But tabletop games and D&D is different because the rules exist to facilitate fun and storytelling. That's the end goal. It really kind of makes me a little bonkers when I do see people commenting about rules on some of these bigger podcasts like live streams and YouTube videos and you scroll down through the comments and they're like, well, they screwed up that rule. I guess they're not good D&D players. And it's like, screw you. If they had fun, yeah. then they're great D&D players. We're going to harp on that point. Yeah, probably a little bit. If you couldn't tell, we're very story driven on this podcast. If that hasn't become apparent by now. Yeah. And so, yeah, you don't need every rule. You just need the basics to keep things moving. And to basically arbitrate when things come to a stop. Yeah. That's when the rules kick in. Shit, how do we handle this? How do we do this? How do we do that? But until you come to that point, you can say whatever the hell you want. And as you get better at DMing, you'll get better at fine-tuning that balance that creates the fairness and creates a challenge for the players. But in the beginning, like, don't worry so much about that. Just focus on keeping things moving. And going back to that point of people being on the same page at the table, if you're playing with a group that's all learning together, that works so much better. Like, have your players be helping you learn the rules. If some of them are learning at the same time, that's great. The really cool thing, so there's kind of two scenarios where new DMs are playing. Scenario one is where nobody else at the table knows what's going on. They're all brand new. You guys all just muddled through figuring out how to build a character together. <laughs> and now you're ready to play. Great. The DM can say literally whatever the hell they want. <laughs> and everyone's going to go with it. You're going to try. You're going to learn together. Scenario two is is where there is another DM at the table. Maybe everyone knows what they're doing. Yeah, or even a player that studied the rules a lot because that's kind of their personality and their mindset around the game. And I want to get into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so this is obviously going to be a series of episodes about DMing. Um, but in a later episode, I want to dig into this in a little in a little bit more depth. But right now... The most important thing for other DMs or other experienced players at the table is really if there are any rules or any kind of arbitration, if you are an experienced DM and there's somebody learning at the table, take a back seat, sit back, don't interrupt you know, the flow of the game to correct some kind of rule that you know to be different than what was just described. It's a note, sure, to bring up at the end of the game, say, yeah. hey, by the way. But beyond that, if everyone's still having fun, then keep the game rolling. Don't, yeah. don't stop the flow to flip to page 70 and rules lawyer the hell out of a game. <laughs> I don't like to watch movies where like the set manager comes out. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> it's like, whoa, hey, hold up. They just didn't <laughs> stop the take. They, they just kept going. And the, the continuity expert yeah. kind of walks out onto the set and is just like, moves a jar to the <laughs> left and then walks back off and they just left that in the final cut of the film. Yeah. <laughs> you may have noticed we haven't actually mentioned any rules yet. And that's because there's just a very core concept to know and everything else you can you could read the books on your own. You can go to dndbeyond.com. They have the basic rules there for free of the particular tabletop game we love. Going back to that core concept we were talking about just needing to know the path forward. And if a rule stops you dead in the middle of your game, just make up a path, have someone keep a list of unknown rules, and look them up at the end. Yeah. Keep that flow going. As the DM, you're going to need to make some creative calls in some weird situations, but that's fine. And what the interesting thing is about D&D &D is, again, like you said, normally rules are there to arbitrate some kind of winner. And in this case, the winner should always be the party, the party and the players and the, the fun that's being had. So what it all kind of boils down to is you've got dice that will help randomly determine that. Like if you're brand new to D&D, &D, uh, I wouldn't imagine that this concept is surprising anybody right now. 
But as just kind of a reality check, the dice are there to just throw a little bit of wild randomness into the game so that the DM and the players are all surprised. Yeah, and the story can develop in different directions. And that basic mechanic is a character wants to do something. And the only time you break out the dice to roll is if there's a chance of failure. And on top of that, if that failure would be interesting to the story. Does it add an extra element of drama or intrigue or holy shit? Then that's when you... Yeah, that's when you roll that dice. You add a number. You figure out what number that you're trying to hit. And you resolve it. Your character has a skill that adds a little bit more to that number to give you a better chance. And that is it. That's every situation in D&D. Repeat. And you, you repeat it <laughs> forever with more story <laughs> elements tacked on. So the next fear. I have to create a fantasy world That's full a- of people and places, cities, towns, cities, bathrooms, alcoves, everywhere. You have to figure all of that out. Creatures, tea shops. I wouldn't want a DM either. Or, of course, you have to learn a world that's been fleshed out to that minute amount of detail. Hell no. (laughs) What? I've been learning the Forgotten Realms, and it's only taken me like 10 years to get the basics. (laughs) There's so much lore. Uh, Yeah. I mean, spoiler alert. Again, we're going to get into more of this in the next episode. But the world only needs to be as large as the room the characters are currently in when you start a game when you start dming there's a reason that most adventuring parties start in a tavern because that's the basic there's a room you know uh, what a tavern is you can grasp that concept you can tie all of that together into lived experiences and from there the adventure develops and if you need any details for that first room that we're suggesting you start in one room or one space. But if you need details for that, there's tons of generators online. If you can't really think of anything, just Google it, like Tavern Generator. I think that is that is an official thing that we're, we've written down to discuss in this episode. But also, I've heard that a lot too. I'm not creative. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to be creative. <laughs> it helps to have a fertile imagination, sure. But like you said, there's hundreds of creators out there, random generators that will make up a person, a tavern, a a tavern owner, a bar person, a server in that tavern. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you have the start of an adventure. (laughs) And when you're ready to continue on and keep building your world, check out our episode with uh, the guest Famous Hippopotamus one of our early episodes, but we talk about that greater world building there and creating a campaign and all of that. And it's really still pretty simple. Like you don't need all the details of the world. Well, and you can take that from one of the most tenured DMs that we've ever uh, had the pleasure of speaking to. If you talk to him, he says, start with a place, a simple (laughs) place. And whether they go north or south, that's what you flesh out next. Don't start with this big grand world map. I mean, you're more than welcome to, but that's a lot of lore to keep in your head. And beyond just having a kind of a concept, there's really no more world building that needs to be done. And I always like to use movies as as examples of stuff that we talk about. But if you do sit down at a table and there's tons of exposition about the world before you start playing, that isn't necessarily super interesting to the players until their character's in that world. Because I just think of the movies that I watch where they start out with like five minutes of exposition. Oh. And I've almost like I've caught a couple of details and I know I should be focusing on it because the next two hours are going to be built off of that. But I'm just not quite in it to the degree where I'm ready to learn that yet. And truthfully, creating a gigantic world can actually work against a new DM because if as of a new player to this world, you kind of start and you detail out this massive map. I want to, if you're going for kind of a sandboxy feel, and that's kind of why you need a world map, because you want to say like, hey, this world is grand and you can go anywhere. Yeah. That's almost more daunting. If you just start 
off somewhere and like I said, take a left or a right, whichever direction you want to go, that feels to the player to be more freeing than, say, a grandly detailed world map and exactly how all of these kingdoms play together and things like that. And don't get me wrong, that can be fun to build those worlds, but all we're saying is it's not necessary right off the bat. You don't need to do it before you try DMing. Yeah, absolutely. World building is one of my favorite hobbies. (laughs) Absolutely. It is a ton of fun. But beyond just adding a little bit more fun for you to the game, I don't think it make or breaks a player's experience, especially for a new DM. Yeah, for sure. So if you're new, make that decision to run a short self-contained game that everyone knows is going to be a practice run. Keep that world simple. In the next episode, we're going to cover some prep work that shows how simple a story can be starting off in that room. So the next fear. I have to be a super good voice actor and role player. And I have to I have to play these characters to their core and come up with fully fleshed out people and orcs and elves. Yeah, I am not Matt Mercer. Nor am I, actually. So this is one of those things that I think Matt Mercer gets blamed for (laughs) a lot of people's expectations about a game, but he's just doing it to the best of his ability. And his ability is a voice actor. Yeah. So as far as a strategy to kind of deal with this fear of saying like, oh man, I have to do crazy voices and I got to do little squeaky voices and I have to do a goblin voice. And like, it doesn't, You don't have to do that. That's just fun if you feel like being a weirdo. And it's a skill that you can develop over time. Again, you're brand spanking new at it. Yeah. I don't think it matters all that much. I think it's fun, but you can just start with your normal voice. Yeah. And in fact, I've seen a lot of DMs say and describe a voice. She says to you in a very lilting, warm tone, Welcome to my tavern. That works just as well. I don't have to pretend to be, you know, to try and make that voice. Yeah. I can just say it. I, as a player, understand, oh, I can imagine what that sounds like. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And your players are going to know it's you anyway, so don't feel like you have to trick them with a crazy, intense, elaborately practiced voice. If you do want to start trying to change your voice in some simple ways to start creating differences, honestly, I still do this. I kind of get stuck in the same three or four voices sometimes, or even one or two, but you can just try going slower. I'm looking for someone. Ooh, faster. I'm looking for someone. That's two voices already. Go a little (laughs) bit higher and go a little bit lower, and all of a sudden you've got like nine combinations of things that you can do to create different voices and you haven't used a thick Scottish accent and you haven't (laughs) done all these crazy things to try and... When I first started DMing, every NPC was a dwarf. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Scottish or English accents and I have a lower pitched voice. So every single NPC, women sounded like men and (laughs) boys sounded like adults men (laughs) they all just sounded the same because i could only do the one yeah and i still can only do the one (laughs) we haven't gotten much better it's true and a a good npc to get into kind of the their personality and the role-playing aspect of it isn't that complicated either it's what they look like what they act like and what they want and that can be fairly simple i mean if i describe a tall stern woman that wants the rats out of her basement done i've got a picture of who she is yeah i know exactly what she looks like and that's part of the fun of playing an imagination game the final fear that we want to tackle is this fear that you as a dm have to have a Lord of the Rings-esque, world domination, (laughs) fates hang in the balance kind of story to tell full of drama and intrigue. It's tempting to fall into that. Oh my God. 
if I had that expectation on me, I would never <laughs> want to start to DM. I have to tell a Tolkien-esque sc- story about an evil wizard that's going to destroy the universe? No, because honestly, we've played some great games that were as simple as, you know, like a bottle episode of TV. Yeah. Where everything just happens within this this one space. It could be one room. Hmm. And there are fun things that have come out of that. It can all happen in the, in a single tavern. You don't have to create this this political Jason Bourne double crossing <laughs> kind of craziness. Most of the fun of D and D is just having a beer and sitting around with a bunch of friends. And our players have done this routinely. And seem to be endlessly entertained <laughs> by asking you to perform and just continue with this NPC. So you've done this before where you said, uh, yeah, so the guard's name is uh, Junceford, I think, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you just made up this rando name that yeah. wasn't even a, a particularly great name. And then they say, where are you from, Junceford? <laughs> uh... From the town next door. Just keep flowing with answers to the questions, and we end up spending tons of time there fleshing out Chunceford, the lovelorn. (laughs) (laughs) And now they're in the game forevermore. (laughs) They're best friends with Chunceford. (laughs) And they're trying to, literally, they're trying to set him up on a date because (laughs) they are invested in his relationship (laughs) and how he's not in one right now. And we're going... Guys, we have this epic story <laughs> that you don't give a shit about. We just want to talk about Chunceford. That's fine. Let's explore Chunceford. And that's totally cool. Yeah. Like, we've had to table some of our bigger stories because the players just wanted to have fun. And and when you're in that state of flow with everybody, you realize that your whole session's gone by and you've all had such a good time hanging out with Clunceford. That's what his name was. Clunceford. Clunceford. <laughs> See? He's so he's so not essential to the story <laughs> that it's hard to even remember who they are because the players have grown this this crazy attachment to them. And as far as being creative within boundaries, now I can create a story around Clunceford that they can go down that path if they want. <laughs> so yeah, it really doesn't matter. And those are some of the best times too. Like We've had games where people have been crying, laughing so hard because this kind of crazy stuff just comes up. And that's what makes uh, a great game go so well. And the story doesn't have to necessarily be told. And I've thrown away. And this is that that idea that DMs have to prepare like 200 hours before every single game. Preparation isn't totally necessary. Because I've thrown out 80% of what I prepped for a game when I over-prepare. Yeah. So the trick is don't over-prepare. Yeah, for sure. But we're going to get into more of that. I hope that was helpful. I hope more players get into DMing. Just give it a try. The next time the DM isn't able to do the session, say, hey, you know what? We're just going to do a one-off, and I'm going to step up, and I'm going to try DMing. Yeah. And it might be awful, but we're going to keep our regular weekly game night. I'm just going to step in for a, a bottle episode. <laughs> yeah, that can be super fun. And if you can't even find players, but you desperately want to DM, you just want to try it, just reach out to me. I'll be your player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll help you figure that shit out. We'll get in there. <laughs> And to kind of continue on this journey of learning to be a new DM, there's a lot of really cool resources we're going to put in the show notes. But let me just run through them real quick. You've got D&D Beyond. I mentioned there's a new player guide on there that's really simple, really visually easy to follow. Mm. Tells you how to play. Yeah. You've got DM tips run by Satine Phoenix that she has guests. They talk about DMing. It's wonderful. You've got uh, Sly Flourish. I really like his work. Mike Shea, he's done a couple of books called The Lazy DM. And he's all about keeping it simple and running those games without too much prep. And I think it's easy to think that you're 
alone in the idea. I mean, I know for speaking from our perspective, we kind of felt like we were alone to lift the story so high and really kind of play within the rules like we know the rules, but we will bend them really easily and we will break them a lot of the time for the sake of story. And I always thought that we were kind of alone and it's so wonderful as we continue to meet more people and have that same mentality shared with people like Sly Flourish, like Satine Phoenix, like all of these great DMs yeah. that hold the story in the highest regard and don't have to bog down with the rules unless they the want game to. comes to a stop. Yeah, if everyone's having fun figuring out rules, do that. <laughs> <laughs> so keep sticking around. If you're a new DM, we want this series of episodes to kind of be your primer. So if you haven't DM'd before, this is going to be your guide. And we're going to close out this series of episodes with a super exciting guest. So keep your ears tuned for that. We're going to try something new at the end of this episode, though. Mm. Go on. Okay. <laughs> I was. I was. <laughs> Don't cut me off. Uh, we're going to do a contest. Our first ever Hook and Chance contest. And the prize is going to be a copy of Keith Amon, a recent guest of ours, new book, The Monsters Know What They're Doing, an amazing resource full of tactics that just adds so much to your game. A must-have for DMs. Yes. So how this is going to work is Travis and I have a monster in mind. At the end of each episode, you're going to get a little clue to what that monster is. If you can guess the name of the monster, then leave us a review on iTunes. That's how you enter the contest. And then you can reach out to us on any social media platform. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, whatever you want. Discord. Tell us which review you left and what monster you're guessing. You diabolical bastard. <laughs> All right. Let's hear it. What's the clue? Okay, these clues are going to be simple. You're probably not going to get it from this one. It's going to be an ongoing thing. It's going to be the same monster week after week. Here's the first clue. Until somebody figures it out. Yeah, first person to figure it out wins that book and we move on. If you guys like this, we'll do it again. Here it is. It opens its mouth to make a sound and you see its jagged teeth in the torchlight. Mmm. That's it. That could be so many monsters. <laughs> I know. Good luck <laughs> trying to figure out what this is. One guess per week, people. Okay, well, you can DM. It's a super fun hobby that'll lead you down a million paths. This is the greatest of games, and DMing Whoa. is a calling. Yes. When you feel it. <laughs> if you don't feel it, then s whatever. Yeah. Sorry, this episode was a waste <laughs> of time for you. But if you do feel it, if you if you even feel a slight pull towards that, DMing. That tingle in your heart. Of creating and having fun and just being a goof and trying to share a story. This is the best way to do that. All right. I think we've uh, rambled enough about our love for this game. Thank you to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects you heard in this episode. Aforementioned, leave those guesses on any of our socials at Hook and Chance on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Discord, Reddit. Thanks for listening. And play, play great, great games. games.